Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 430 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday lunch bag for answering this trivia question. Rigel, our sponsor today, is headquartered in Florida. Name NASA's primary launch center for space flight. Answer now using the question feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to our MD Expo Fall Conference, which takes place next month, October the 5th to 7th, which will bring HTM professionals from across the nation to Seattle for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services. There's still time to register, so register now using promo code 18MDE304, and that's compliments of Rigel. Details can be found at mdexposhow.com forward slash Seattle. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our webinar Wednesday lunch bag is. And it is, where are we? Uh, Andrew Kogel. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Congratulations, Andrew. The correct answer is John F. Kennedy Space Center. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Rigel Medical. Rigel Medical is a leading manufacturer of biomedical test equipment, including electrical safety analyzers, vital sign simulators, infusion pump analyzers, electrical surgical analyzers, and Medibase asset management software. For more information, visit rigelmedical.com forward slash USA. Our presenter today is Jack Barrett, National Business Development Manager at Rigel Medical. Jack, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you out there in biomed land, as the, uh, the case may be. I also want to uh, certainly thank Tech Nation for providing this opportunity to us, and I also have to give a special thank you to the uh, folks over at Irby USA for allowing us to have uh, use of one of their generators, the 300D, to uh, pull together some of the videos that will be incorporated into this presentation. So, uh, <laughs> the generator for today's discussion is the, uh, the VO300D from uh, Irby USA, headquartered in Germany. And uh, lots of applications for this in the endo um, process procedures. Lots of buttons on this generator. So let's take a look at those and talk about what they all do. Capture this from their service manual. And of course, there's the, uh, the power switch. And once you hit the power switch, it uh, does some self-diagnostics and runs through a little test process. Along the sides of the screen, you'll see a number of buttons, function keys, if you will. And you'll see the use of those as we do some active demonstrations via video uh, during the course of the presentation. There's up and down buttons just on the right hand side of that, uh, labeled number 10. And then on the far right hand side of the generator, starting at the top, you have the bipolar settings or energy output port, two monopolar energy output ports, and then the patient return connector. Looking at the back of the generator, you have uh, the foot switch sockets labeled number one. And just a, a quick note on those foot switch sockets, as many of you probably know, they are looking for not just a simple switch closure on those foot switch inputs, but a coded signal. So if you're using a test instrument, a test analyzer, such as the product that uh, we manufacture, there is a special adapter that will take our contact closure output and convert it into the pulse train necessary for the generator to recognize the, uh, the signal to turn on the, uh, the generator, turn on the RF portion of the generator. And that just helps the, uh, the PM process to go a little quicker, a little smoother. 
There's the uh, Irby communication bus connector. Uh, for those of you who have been around for a little while, that's actually CAN bus. CAN bus uh, was originally implemented in the automo automotive market because it is a, a fairly low cost, inexpensive communication port. And uh, Irby chose to use um, that as kind of the basis of their communication structure internally and externally to the generator as well. And then you have on the final right hand bottom side, the AC power input fuses and such. So in the interest of time for today's presentation, we won't go through the, uh, the theory of electrical surgery where we talked a little bit about the, uh, the history starting with uh, Bill Voe and what he all did and the first uh, successful input operation conducted with a uh, generator. But we'll, uh, we'll bypass that. That is available in a handbook that we've produced. You'll see uh, a note on that at the end of today's presentation. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity to join us at one of our uh, sessions where we're doing hands-on training, we, uh, we certainly incorporate that portion into that session. So jumping along, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit here about the, the standard for ESU generator manufacturers, the 6601-2-2. Uh, probably you're all familiar with the 6601-1 specification, which deals with uh, more electrical safety aspects and how a manufacturer has to test the medical device during its uh, development and in the manufacturing stage. And then the dash two dash two deals primarily exclusively really with ESU generators. So the specification uh, gives the minimum safety requirements that must be met for this unit to be uh, used out in the marketplace in the case of US to go through the 501k process and get uh, FDA approval for use on patients within the, uh, the US. But they are the minimum uh, requirements. So a manufacturer can tighten up those specifications as they feel appropriate for their product. And uh, probably a good example of that, we'll see a little bit later on when we start talking about high frequency leakage testing. The standard there states 150 milliamps or four and a half watts of um, leakage current is allowable. Many manufacturers, several manufacturers, tighten up that spec a little bit for different elements such as bipolar where they may specify 70 milliamps of leakage current to be acceptable. So we're going to focus in on the 300D. So this is again pulled directly from their service manual and they call it safety check. Here we, uh, we're probably more familiar with you know the PM process and calling it the P, uh, PM check itself. But they go through and a bit of an eye chart here. I apologize for that. I'm not going to, uh, to read this to you. You can do it much better than I can, more than likely. But we go through, as with many PM processes, we start with a visual chest, as most issues, problems are identified, highest percentage of problems are identified during your visual. And then there's a number of elements they want to go through uh, the test. We're talking about electrical safety here, uh, low frequency testing, leakage currents, and such. They're testing foot switch activations, automatic start mode. One of the, uh, the features that the 300D has is a surgeon can have a favorite parameter for a set of effects and power ranges for a certain procedure and he can save that and then call that up as at will within the uh, the 300D. So again, walking through a whole bunch of things here, the spark monitor on, and then the uh, power output testing. And we'll show you examples of conducting power output testing as we start to walk through the presentation itself. So, 
So patient pad monitoring on um, critical in monopolar procedures. A little, uh, a little game here that you all can participate in. I'll give you a, a minute or so to look at the list of manufacturers on the left-hand side of the page. And on the right-hand side, it's all the various names used for patient pad monitoring. So try to match them up, and then we'll, uh, we'll walk through it and give you the solutions. So we'll start with Bovi. And Bovi, of course, again, is the, uh, the originator of the generators, the, uh, the original generator. They have an office in Clearwater, Florida, pretty close to where our office is located in Tampa. And uh, one of the original units is sitting there in their lobby, and they, they share with me that uh, it does still operate but they call their patient pad monitoring split pad. ConMed, ARM, automatic return monitoring. Covidian, REM for return electrode monitoring. Irby, our uh, subject of today. Nessie for neutral electrode safety system. And we'll see that uh, they actually have it called Nessie 2 at this point in time with some revisions that have been made. Megadyne, CQM, contact quality management. And then finally, Olympus, also CQM. So congratulations to anyone who got those all right. So Nessie, within the generator, it's always looking to see what that resistance is on the return pad. In the case of the 300D, along with the resistance, they're also looking at the current uh, flowing through that return pad. And just like with all other generators, there are limits as to if that pad starts coming loose. Um, as it comes loose, the current passing through the patient is starting to be concentrated in a smaller area, and uh, that can result in patient burns, which is a terrible thing. I, uh, I have removed all nasty photos of REM burns or Nessi burns from the presentation as it's just after lunch for some of you and uh, approaching lunch for others. So there's a high limit and a low limit where the generator, the RF generator will not be allowed to turn on depending on what that resistance value is of the Nessie circuit. So we're gonna take a look now at how it's tested within the, the 300D. Well, as I go to the video, you know, we'll notice that the indicator lights are flashing on the, uh, the generator itself. And that is just simply because the cameras that I used in our video studio have a faster update rate than the generator is. And you're going to see the, uh, the lights flashing as a result of that. So jumping to a video. Here is the startup screen of the generator. And I've gone to now the Nessie test screen. And you see that's uh, basically red light, green light. You see all the, uh, the things flashing for us. I'm inserting the patient pad uh, cable into the generator. I'm going up to the analyzer that we're utilizing for the discussion today. I am making connections to the output circuit of the, uh, the test circuit. And the generator is always going out and looking at that, what that resistance value is. And it's doing that at a frequency of probably 70 hertz or so. And you can see that I have set a resistance in of 100 ohms or so, and the light is green. I'm going to increase that resistance until the, uh, the light turns red. And that is the upper limit then of the Nessie circuit. As I lower it, it goes back down to green. And we have tested the, uh, the REM circuit or the Nessie circuit. So 
So now let's take a look at power output testing. And before we go into testing the actual 300D, I'd like to uh, just share with you that the process for testing power output is identical as far as making the connections and how you test. What you'll see is with variations for certain generator manufacturers is what they would like their test resistance to be. But in every case, we're coming from the active electrode of the generator, we're going through a resistance value, we're going through a current transformer, or somehow measuring current, uh, perhaps through a shunt resistor, we happen to use a, a current transformer ourselves, and then back to the dissipative electrode, be it the return plate for monopolar, or through the dissipative electrode for a, a bipolar forcep. So taking a look at what some of those differences are, here is uh, the test values for a ConMed system 5000. And as you look down through the table uh, under load resistance, you'll see that they like to use 500 ohms for all of their settings and they will do pass fail as does the 300D based on power output. And just a quick note on, you'll see the HF leakage is a good example of how a manufacturer can specify a tighter specification to the dash two dash two specification, where that would say leakage current has to be less than 150 milliamps in this particular system for the uh, the ConMed, they limit the uh, available or the amount of leakage current that they would like to see at 100 milliamps. Here is Value Lab, and you'll see depending as to the type of test, whether it's coag or cut or bipolar, they will use various resistance values: 500 uh, for the coag, 300 for cut 100 for bipolar. The Megadyne units, they, uh, they use 300 ohms for the cut for blend coag 500. The AEX for Medtronic, they uh, use 100 ohms uh, for several tests, 500 ohms, and then 1,000 for, for some of the tests as well. And you see their tolerances are all based on power output as the, uh, the Urb 300D is. The examples that we're going to uh, show in the videos are based upon the specification sheet they provide for incoming inspection and acceptance of the generator going into the, uh, the facility or into the hospital. The full PM is taught in uh, their training school, and we will talk, uh, give some examples of that as far as test specifications and testing and such, but um, we are focused in here on several power output tests, the NESI test circuit, and also uh, the high frequency leakage testing. So again, pulled directly from their service manual, we show connections here for a monopolar test where the active electrode is going into what they call a HF power meter and then coming back to the neutral electrode. And within uh, that power meter, they have the capability to set resistance as we do with our analyzer um, and measure the output power, output currents and such. So here is a summary of the inspection sheet I referenced. We're dealing today again with the 300D. So you see that we're doing uh, five different tests based on monopolar and a couple on bipolar.
As we spoke earlier, we're going to go from the active electrode of the generator and utilizing our analyzer, we're going to go from that active output through a resistance value. In this particular case, it can range from five ohms up to 5,115 ohms. And this uh, element called an MD for measuring device, which is our internal current transformer, and then back to the neutral of the generator itself. So mimics very closely, identically really, to the uh, earlier diagram we just showed. And then we have a photo caption of the analyzer itself and its uh, screen where it captures data. And we show what the load resistance was set for, what the true RMS power was, uh, was captured, true RMS current, et cetera, as you see on the, uh, the display. Well, I said I wasn't going to go into uh, theory of generators much. I did want to take just a, a couple of minutes and talk about power output waveforms. On the top left, it says cutting current, and you'll see that that sinusoidal waveform is being produced at a, uh, a frequency, and the frequency will vary depending a bit on manufacturer to manufacturer, but Normally between 350 kilohertz to 500 kilohertz is the modulation frequency of a generator. And we say cutting current because a waveform that looks like what's shown there in the top left is going to produce uh, power to the patient, a cutting current. And the amplitude is constant throughout the course of that process. As opposed to coag current, which has a variable amplitude associated to it. A little bit further on, we'll talk a bit about crest factor, and, uh, but just briefly, crest factor is the ability of the coag current to do pure coagulation without any cutting. Then we have things that we start to talk about effects or blends. And what we're really doing is we're just playing with the duty cycles of the waveform. So bottom left-hand side is some examples of, we start off with the pure cut waveform where the amplitude is consistent over the course of the process or the course of the procedure. And then there's a couple of blend modes and then pure coag. And what we're doing is changing amplitudes and changing the duty cycle of the waveform going to the test instrument itself, the test pencil. And then finally, we have a, uh, an output on our analyzer that you could connect an oscilloscope to. And there you see a, uh, a snapshot of a fulguration waveform, and you'll see that that varying amplitude mimics the, uh, the drawing that we have above it on the top right-hand side. So when we talk about blends, when we talk about effects, what we're really doing is just playing games with the duty cycle of the waveform being uh, generated by the uh, ESU itself. So to that point, here are the effect settings associated to the 300D. And you'll see that everything is rated at the 500 ohm load resistance that they specify and you see the difference in effects. So the difference in duty cycles then, if you will. And you'll see that effect eight, we get the most power out of the uh, output port, energy port of the generator itself. And as we change the effects, the amount of power is, is starting to decrease. And it makes sense, if you will, because we're talking about playing duty cycles of the waveform, so the longer you leave the voltage across the fixed resistance, the tissue resistance, the more ability you have for current to increase. And as current increases, fixed resistor, you're going to have more power available. So that's uh, kind of how it all works and really does fall down to uh, the basic Ohm's law. I swear it are. You'll see uh, over on the right-hand side in the chart, it gives you the, uh, Modulation frequency, 350 kilohertz of the ERB unit. Again, everything rated at 500 ohms. You'll see the crest factors. 
uh, for the different effect settings. And again, crest factor will give you an indication of the ability of that waveform to do pure coagulation without cutting. And you'll see what the, uh, the maximum high frequency peak voltage would be, and this would happen in coag, uh, 1450 volts peak. So we spoke of Crest Factor a couple of times now, and from a calculation perspective, it is the ratio of peak voltage to RMS voltage. So cut waveforms typically have very low Crest Factors, below two, because the amplitude of the waveform is consistent. They're not varying the amplitude. Coag waveforms have higher Crest Factors, and we saw that with the different effect settings that we had in the previous slide for the uh, 300D. So we're just going to start showing some videos now, uh, short videos on uh, doing actual testing. The first that we will do is auto cut. Uh, we're gonna set the effect for eight, which is maximum. And we're going to set the uh, power output for maximum as well. The drawing down on the, uh, the lower right-hand side is just a, a quick reminder that for monopolar, we're using the patient return as our dissipative electrode. And then when we go to bipolar, uh, the dissipative electrode is the other end of the forcep tool. So again, this is the opening screen. So you'll see it'll start to go through. Monopolar, we're going to look for auto cut. We're going to go to our effect setting, set it for eight, as indicated by the sheet. We're going to set the power output. The other thing we're going to do is set the foot switches, which when I'm doing demonstrations on the 300D is, is something that I frequently forget to do. And then I stand there wondering why I'm not getting any power output. So I'm selecting power test, continual operation, continuous operation. I'm going to set my resistance, uh, monopolar first. I'm going to set my resistance for 500 ohms. Going to select my operation for cut. Here's my diagram. So coming from the active electrode of monopolar through my resistor, through my current transformer, back to the return. Start my test. Again, we're using a foot uh, foot switch simulation simulator to turn on the RF generator, and uh, there was the test with the power output being that was being measured falling within specification of the specification sheet. So that was our auto cut. Now we're going to change things around and do the dry cut. Notice your little visual there is changing a bit, depending as to the uh, the effect settings and the selections I make, whether it's auto cut or dry cut. Start my test. Capture my data. So our next test, according to their uh, operational sheet, is for coag. I'm going to set the effect for four. Resistance remains at 500 ohms, and we're going to set it for 120 watts. So 
So coag settings now on the right hand side. So we're testing at maximum power, 120 watts. Acceptable range is plus or minus 20% for any of the power settings on the 300D. And we measured 117 watts well within the specification of the plus or minus 20%. Also notice how the crest factor is changing a bit as we're going from uh, these various tests. So now, uh, spray coag, effect two, 120 watts. I have to go to the second screen to select spray coag. And there are the test results. And again, 117 watts. So now we're gonna do a bipolar test and just a, a quick snapshot of the difference in connections for bipolar. Bipolar, we're no longer using the uh, return monitor, the return plate. We're going from the active electrode of the generator, the power output port, through our resistance, through a current transformer, and then back to the dissipative tine of the forcep. So you see my connections are now at the bipolar output, energy output port. Again, selecting foot, uh, foot switches to be active. We'll select bipolar now on the analyzer. So we set for 90 watts, we measured 86 watts, again, well within the specification. for acceptable power output. And there's just a repeat of the diagram that we use for our connections. So that takes us through the power output testing for the 300D. Now, there is a module for using argon gas with the 300D. Uh, argon, as you know, is an inert gas and the current from the generator itself uh, ionizes or ignites that gas. And the gas is uh, more conductive than air. I think it's one of the biggest advantages of using argon is the tool, the blade of a tool does not come in contact with the tissue. So um, you don't have to worry about charring and cleaning the, uh, the pencil itself as it's being used in a procedure. So we really don't test any further the power outputs because we know the power outputs are good. And the current, again, 
from the generator itself will ignite the gas and that will be used for the procedure. So there's the, uh, the little module that is the, uh, the plasma, the APC as they call it. And just a couple little uh, diagrams here of what that plasma energy looks like. So now we're going to go and we're going to start talking about high frequency leak testing. And if you ever have the uh, the opportunity to visit any ESU manufacturer, somewhere in their facility will be this bench. Uh, everything on this bench is very well defined from the uh, material used for construction of the wooden bench to the height of the bed bench to the length of the bench to the layout of the wiring for doing high frequency leakage testing to where the uh, resistance values are for high frequency leakage testing it's specified in the dash two dash two specification that we utilize 200 ohms for conducting these tests so everything is very well identified laid out as far as how the manufacturer has to do this test uh, to be in compliance with the specification. Now, the, the good news for us is we don't have to follow this uh, rigorous process that they show here. The only thing that we want to be sure of is that we keep our leads as short as possible to do the, uh, the testing for high frequency leakage, that we don't have uh, any coils in our test leads and such, as that would add inductance and uh, have impact. It would actually increase what the, uh, the currents would be that we're measuring. So a little bit easier process for us to do high frequency leakage testing. Just as we do single fault conditions with our low frequency or electrical safety testing, in high frequency leakage testing, we're always testing in single fault conditions. And that, those conditions would be what happens if the active electrode opens, or what happens if the dissipative or return electrode opens, what would be the leakage current that can possibly uh, be seen by the or flow through the patient itself. And as we said, that specification as to the 6601-2-2 says that leakage current cannot be any more than 150 milliamps. Um, and with a, a 200 ohm resistor, that equates to I squared R, four and a half watts of uh, maximum power can be um, identified for leakage. Now again, a manufacturer, and we've seen some examples of that, can specify something lower for their operation. So here's a little test diagram, and this is a monopolar, since we're using, um, showing coag here, and we're, the single fault condition is an open active electrode, nothing connected to the 200 ohm resistor coming from the active electrode of the generator itself, but we're taking a look at the neutral or the return plate electrode putting that through the current transformer, through a 200 ohm resistor, and would then be measuring what the, uh, the leakage current is. And all of these tests are always done at the maximum power setting, worst case um, process, worst case scenario for the generator. So if it's rated for 300 watts, uh, you'd be doing this test at 300 watts. And here's the connection diagram on the side of our analyzer that shows that connector or that uh, neutral connector going to one side of our current transformer. We have fixed 200 ohm resistors inside our analyzer itself. And you see our connection diagram so that one end of the current transformer goes to one end of the resistor the other end of that 200 ohm resistor goes to ground to measure the leakage current. Now, how do we test leakage current in the Irby 300D? Uh, the cool thing is 
we don't. Earlier generators from Irby, like the ICT series, we did have to, uh, to do high frequency leakage testing. And again, the connections would be the same as we just showed, uh, coming from one of the energy ports of the generator, um, whether it's the active or the dissipative connected and through the 200 ohm resistor. But the 300D has internal sensing circuitry that identifies if there is an open circuit, identifies that single fault condition, and then automatically shuts down the RF generator. So for those who are wondering why you've never done high frequency leakage testing with the 300D, there's the, uh, the reasoning behind it. So just a couple of uh, closing comments and remarks here now. Uh, we talked a little bit, we showed you really the, uh, the analyzer that we were using for the course of the today's discussion presentation with the, the Irby 300D. Here's a little sample of what the data that is saved within the analyzer looks like when you're running an auto test sequence. And we have auto test sequences for a variety of different manufacturers. And if you look down probably two thirds of that, you'll see what the uh, data is captured for a test. The rest of it is all setup instructions and such, what we call user tests. Um, there was a test here done at 10 watts. And you see that it was set for 100 ohms. It was a bipolar test. And what the uh, resistance was, what the actual measured power was, the true RMS current, RMS voltage, peak voltage, peak to peak voltage, and the crest factor. And uh, if you were to take the RMS voltage and divide that into the peak voltage, you would get that number 1.6. So we certainly appreciate all your time uh, spent with us today. We show a little uh, snapshot of our booklet, booklet for uh, the guidelines on electrosurgery. That also goes into the history, talking about uh, O. Harvey and Bovey and the first patient who had a brain tumor where the, uh, the first Bovey unit was done or utilized. I do want to give a little plug here for META, uh, Medical Equipment and Technology Association. This is a national organization for biomeds. Uh, MyMeta.com is the website. It is, uh, you can join free of charge. It does not compete with your local organizations, but is more national in scope and trying to promote on a national basis. The, uh, the issues that uh, impact us day to day. And now we will uh, start our Q&A portion of today's session. Okay, thank you so much, Jack. Yeah, we've got a few questions here. The first one is, what was that foot switch adapter you, you were using and is it necessary? Ah, okay, yeah, the foot switch adapter. Um, again, the 300D, in fact, all of the uh, VO series that uh, Irby manufacturers uses a coded foot switch. So it's just not looking, the generator is just not looking for a simple contact closure as most other generators are. Uh, Olympus does pretty much the same thing as well. So that foot switch adapter that I, um, I used in the testing, you may have see, seen it in the video sitting on the side of the unit, not sure. Um, that takes the contact closure that we produce from our analyzer, turns that into the coded signal that turns on the RF generator within the, uh, the generator, the 300D itself. And it is necessary. Or you can use a, uh, the foot switches that come with the unit and just watch the LEDs on the front of the analyzer and step on the foot switch when the light goes on and take your foot off the foot switch when the light goes off. That's another way you can do it. Okie dokie. Now, does the Irby have their own test boxes? Yeah, they do. Um, you'll see mention of that in their, uh, their service manual that is provided to the folks who go to the Irby school. 
Um, they have their own resistance test boxes and, and such. Um, you can certainly utilize, uh, purchase those from them, uh, but they are fixed to that generator or to the VO series of generators. So if you're looking for an, um, test products that are a little bit more universal, you can look at uh, manufacturers such as Rigel to be a little bit more uh, universal. Okay, and do you have test sequences for Urbi generators? Sure do. The answer to that is an astounding yes. Okay, um, and leading on to that, are there any propriety proprietary devices that only Irby supplies to complete the full PM? Well, I'm sorry, hit me with that one again? Yes, it's, are there any proprietary devices that only Irby supplies to complete the full PM? <laughs> to my knowledge, uh, when you go to the Irby school, they will use their, uh, they have a couple of different test boxes that could, that uh, they do their training with. Um, there is nothing, and those of course all have Irby part numbers and can be purchased through Irby, such as the, uh, the foot switch adapter that we spoke of previously. However, there is nothing there that a uh, commercially available analyzer like what we manufacture um, would not be able to do. Okay, so do many of the newer units have self-testing or analyzers in their programs? No. Uh, again, to my knowledge, and I, I'm, I'm pretty up to speed on the latest uh, introductions from uh, all the various manufacturers, none of them have the capability to self-monitor power output testing. Um, many of them, or a couple of them, do have internal current transformers at various ports, points within their uh, generator circuitry, and they can report out what the currents are, but it does not automatically do internal pass-fails based on that. Probably the, uh, the closest of that being accomplished is what we just spoke of with the um, the 300D being able to identify uh, if there was a single fault condition like an open lead in either the active or the dissipative electrode where it automatically shuts down the uh, the RF generator. That would be the, the best example that I know of. Okie dokie. Um, another question is asking about pulsed outputs like in the ConMed System 5000, the attendee would like a bit more information. Yeah, the System 5000 along with, um, oh goodness, uh, ConMed also introduced a, um, another generator recently and I, I can't for the life of me think of uh, that model number. But there are post outputs um, from the 5000 the the question probably revolves around can our analyzer capture those um those outputs and do the measurements and the answer is yes for coag okay now just going back to the foot switch adapters i've got an attendee asking do you need different foot switch adapters for different manufacturers yeah so the uh the interesting thing on that is every manufacturer has their own pinouts um, with the exception of Megadyne, which uses the same pinouts as Covidian does. Um, what can get confusing when you look at a ConMed connector, foot switch connector, and a Valley Lab foot switch connector, um, the connectors are identical. However, the pins that they use for activation are different. So uh, just make sure that you have good labeling on your connectors and you'll, uh, you'll be good to go. Great. We've got one more question. It's regarding cost of analyzers. Um, have you got a general cost or would you prefer attendees to contact you directly? Well, um, I, I will say this. We'd be very happy to, uh, to talk to anyone who, uh, who wanted to take a look at our pricing compared to uh, the other folks who might be out there. 
Uh, some may even be listening to this presentation. Don't know. But um, I will just simply say that uh, we'd be very happy to provide a quotation to, uh, to anyone um, except for those noted competitors. Um, but I will, I will share with you that the price and performance um, points of our analyzer, and I, I've refrained from saying the name up to this point, I'll say it now, Unitherm, is, uh, is unmatched. I mean, it's the most competitive price product out there, and it has uh, certainly the, one of the highest points of capabilities out there. Okay, that's great. I've got one more question. Have you conducted a graph mode power measurement for, I think it's a VO, VIO 3000D's endo cup modes? <laughs> um, the Unitherm, and I've said it twice now, does have the capability to do um, graph power measurements. So uh, we've worked with a, a couple of um, companies, actually a manufacturer of test tools, to do exactly that, where they're looking at performance of uh, the tools that they produce um, they've looked at those in conjunction with the uh, 300D, and we can generate a graph of different points of resistance at a given power to uh, to show what those outputs look like. Yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, looks like we're coming up to nearly our hour. So thank you, Jack, for a great and informative webinar again, and also thank you again to today's sponsors, Rigel Medical. Uh, one lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. Thanks once again for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week. Have a great rest of your day.